Hello everyone and thanks for tuning in. This is uh, Eyes to the Sky Environmental Services and today we're going to talk about a different way of calculating storm relative helicity. So you may have seen um, the video that I did on using the layer centering technique for calculating storm relative helicity, but this is uh, going to be the more conventional way of doing so. This is going to be the way that was presented by Robert Davies Jones back in 1990 and also the uh, concept of storm relative helicity goes back to Lilly back in 1980, I believe, 6, 1986, but Robert Davies Jones in 1990 um, was the one that really put forth the effort to, to really develop the, the hard concept and, and, the, and the theory behind it. So let's jump on into it. Um, the first thing that we're going to do is, is I'm going to present a wind profile right here. Um, this isn't from any particular date. But this is the one that we're going to use to calculate storm relative felicity using this um, more conventional way of doing things, the textbook or more the university approach of, of, of doing it. Um, as you see down here in red, you will not always be given the wind direction as indicated in the, in the example above. You can see I have the wind direction um, and the speed for each layer. Um, the surface obviously would be um, out of 180 at uh, 15 knots. But so because you're not always given the direction um, as indicated here, you may have to sometimes measure the angle with a protractor um, if you're not given it otherwise. So also keep in mind that you must convert the wind direction from traditional compass degrees uh, to a mathematical form that will allow you to use sine and cosine in order to calculate the U and V components. Uh, this is not bad at all, so don't worry. Um, we'll go on over that more in just a sec. Um, as you can see here on in, the, in these two green boxes, on the left box you have uh, compass degrees, traditional compass degrees, 0, 180, and 90, and 270. And then here you have mathematical degrees. So basically what this is uh, happens here in mathematical degrees, you shift everything clockwise 90 degrees. So instead of um, <clears throat> and 0 being up here, it's now here, etc. And another thing that you want to, so in other words, uh, using the compass degrees, the example that I've provided, this blue arrow, um, it was from 225 degrees, from the compass degree direction. But it's always the direction it's coming from in, in the compass degree frame of reference. But when you shift over to mathematical degrees, which is what you have to do to, convert, uh, to calculate SRH, you have to make the conversion to mathematical degrees. It's the direction the wind is heading toward. So no longer the direction it's heading from, but the direction it's heading toward. And so in this case, um, it's heading toward 45 degrees in the mathematical degree reference frame. So toward 45 degrees. Um, Again, this is the wind profile that we're looking at here, and we're, and we're trying to derive SRH from. Um, I went ahead and I used this wind profile and made the conversions to mathematical degrees. Um, you can see here that um, at uh, 700 millibars, we're toward 20 degrees. At 850, uh, we're toward 50, and from the surface, we're toward 90 degrees. And then another thing you have to go ahead and do is you have to convert the speed from knots, which is normally what we see in a, in a vertical wind profile, right, in skew T's. We have to convert from knots to meters per second. And so from 700 millibars, you see a 70 knots, that equals 36.01 meters per second, etc. down on the list, on down that list, and just complete that process. Okay, so let's go on. Uh, step number two is finding the U and V components of each wind measurement using mathematical degrees only. Before uh, you start getting, you know, thinking you, you can't follow, just hold on. We'll, we'll get to the, uh, this is not really that bad, guys. We, we'll, we will make easy sense of it. Um, for this, you will use sine for the V component, which is north-south, uh, and cosine for the U component, which is east-west. So let's jump right on into the process and, and do an example, okay? So if we use the information that we were looking at here and that we derived from this page, if we use it here, uh, the U component at 700 millibars 
As we know, the 36.01, which came from here, when you converted the wind speed at 700 millibars from knots to meters per second, that's here. So you would do 36.01 times cosine, times the cosine of 20 degrees. Now, where does the 20 degrees come from? Oh, it just comes from right here, the mathematical degrees that 700 millibars is moving toward, right? Because we had to make the, com the conversion from compass degrees to mathematical degrees. So after you do that, you do 36.01 meters per second, that's the speed, times the cosine of 20 degrees, that's the direction the wind is moving toward at 700, and that'll give you a value. And then um, from there, you'll go ahead and do your V component, that's fine. So the V component is again the same speed, 36.01 meters per second times the sine of 20 degrees. Uh, that'll give you 12.31. And then you'll, you'll go on and you'll do that for the U's uh, and V's for every level, okay? And then once you get those, you will um, you'll subtract. Um, now we must find the change, the delta of the U and V component between each wind observation on the skew T. Uh, remember that a large chunk of what makes up storm relative felicity is the change, or delta, of wind speed and direction between wind points on the skew T, or layers. Okay, so if we subtract um, 16.53 from 33.83, you just follow the green line on down, and that's 17.3. Um, if you subtract 16.53 uh, from 12.31, well, that's going to give you a negative 7.39. And you just do that for each um, tree color. Uh, you see I've got the, the little ch uh, tree schematic drawn here. You just follow the examples given. And then in C, part C, let's find the U, the average of the U and V components so that we can compute the storm relative component of our storm relative holistic calculation. So how that's done is then you have to take U bar. And what that is, is it's the average between the two layers given. So the average between the, the, of the U component between 850 to 700 is 16.53 plus 33.83. You can see we, we have the U component at 7, the U component at 850, and those two values are then added together and then divided by 2 to average them. That'll give you 25.18. And you'll just do that for each respective layer, for the U component, and then you'll do the V components. So surface, the U average from surface to 850, well, you would just do U surface, then 850, you average those two together and you get 8.26 and the same thing for the V I know I used a tilde above the V here it should be a bar but I couldn't find the V bar in the mathematical directory for symbols um, in Excel so that's what we're going to go with for a symbol for for V bar um, in this case average of V's alright so once you found the averages this is important the reason why you want to find the averages is for calculating the storm relative portion of storm relative felicity um, so that you can um, subtract out the storm motion um, from the from the ground relative wind okay so step three now let's find the storm relative contribution of storm relative felicity as I said previously uh, to accomplish this we need to find the U and V components of the storm motion first and then subtract them from the ground relative U and V components from part C of step two. No problem. Uh, part A, we're going to set the storm motion using 75% of the 700 millibar wind and 30% to the right of this direction. This comes from Maddox from 1976. Uh, he was the first to, um, back when he worked with NSSL, he was the first to complete a study on, a heavy complete study on supercell storm motion. Um, in supercell dynamics, uh, intra supercell dynamics. Uh, therefore, storm motion is 280 at 52 and a half knots. But remember that we must convert all speeds to meters per second before using them. Uh, that's so that we can work with the mathematical frame of reference um, when we start using uh, the degrees, mathematical degrees. So 280 at 27 meters per second are the numbers we want at first, okay? Um, but now we must make sure to convert the storm motion vector from compass degrees to mathematical degrees. So 350 is the correct answer for this step. Now we must have the storm motion in the form that we can use mathematically. 
350 at 27 meters per second. Remember that um, you go back and you look at this chart. So if our initial storm motion was 250, um, that would put it at about like that right there on compass degrees. And then we want to go ahead and move it 30 degrees to the right. And so that's going to put us at a, um, right at about 280. So that's going to be like this. But remember, you want the motion that the vector is heading toward. So if you move that, if we trace it, this is what the vector is going to look like. I should have that on here. But that's about what it's going to do. If we move that over onto the mathematical frame, where is it heading toward? It looks like about 350, doesn't it? So that's why we used this value right here. Okay, so now we're going to go ahead and then proceed to use the storm motion vector we calculated to find the U and V components for storm motion. So 27 meters per second, this is from the storm motion that I just showed you. 27 meters per second times the cosine of 350, that's right here, equals 26.58. And then for the V component of storm motion, 27 sine 350, that'll equal a negative 4.68. Uh, part D, now simply subtract the storm motion U and V components from the U and Vs for each layer in part C of step two to find the storm relative, st uh, storm relative U and V. So again, we'll just go back here. Uh, the uh, U850 to 700 layer, that came from um, this right here, the 25.8, uh, 25.18. Um, that's, that was this component right here. And then you just subtract out your U storm motion um, uh, U vector. And so U component. And that'll give you negative 1.4. Same thing for the U from surface to 850. Well, you just go back. U surface to 850. You found 8.26. That's right here. And then you just take out the U component again, which was 26.58. So minus 26.58. That'll equal uh, negative 18.32. Uh, the V uh, 850 to 700 layer, go back and check out that. That's going to be this one right here. So negative 7.39 minus, keep your signs right, your SIGNs, then minus a minus, which is here, 4.68. That gives you a negative 2.71. And finally, our V surface to 850. That's this one, it's 11.99, so just do 11.99 minus a negative 4.68. That'll give you a 16.67. And then I think it's good to go through and just com uh, compile a little table to keep everything straight. I like to do this in, in uh, research and weather research. It helps keep everything real tight and compact. Professors like tables too, just as a little hint for better grades. Uh, professors really give a thumbs up on, on succinct uh, very concise abbreviated tables uh, with all your stuff really neatly formed in there. That'll really look good on research papers and, and, and term papers and stuff. Okay, so the last step of this after you've put together this table, and I mean if you're good with math you don't really even have to do this table. Uh, you can just keep everything straight. But finally, here's the formula that you want to use right here. This is the big one. But all the, the, the previous work that we've done, the groundwork, has led up to this point uh, to be able to use this formula. But now that we're ready, it's just really plug and chug and keeping your signs straight is all it really is. Um, storm relative felicity equals the storm relative V component uh, of the initial layer. So this will, be, this will be this layer, the surface to 850 or layer 1. This will be layer 1, this whole chunk right here. And then this will be layer 2 which is this, okay? So 16.5, or excuse me, uh, let's follow the equation, VSR. Uh, so VSR of the first layer, 16.67 times delta U, which would be 16.53 minus uh, USR, which is going to be negative 18.32, that goes here, times delta V, which is 11.99, that's here, plus this whole piece right here, um, so this is layer one, so now we're adding layer two, which is this, okay? So just again, follow your formula right here, plug in layer two, and when you do all that, you get 437.898 meters squared per second squared. And keep in mind that meters squared per second squared is also equal to joules per kilogram, which is the way it's often expressed uh, for CAPE.
as you know, buoyancy. But they are the same. They are tantamount. It's just that, uh, or equivalent. It's just that one is typically used uh, to express one physical quantity over the other, but essentially they're the same. You can break down the units, decompose the uh, units, and everything works out uh, to, to, for it to be the same mathematically. Uh, but a few things to keep in mind now that we've gone through the rigor of the mathematics. Uh, storm relative helicity has three main components, okay? This is what you really need to know, um, other than obviously how to find the value. That's cool too, right? Uh, ground relative wind speed shear. This is component one. Ground relative wind directional shear would be component two. And the storm motion is the third component of SRH, okay? So those are the three components, so now we know those. Uh, several caveats exist with storm relative helicity. Uh, predicting storm motion vectors can be a difficult process. Uh, I would highly recommend going back and um, uh, reading the paper by Maddox from 1976. I believe it's on the deviant uh, motion of right moving supercell storms. I believe that's the title of the paper. You could dig that up probably pretty easily, but um, one of the problems that we have not really studied in depth yet is not all supercells move to the right of the mean wind. So, um, and this is not this is not at all to knock the bunkers method. The bunkers method is of st predicting storm motion is excellent, but um, I think one of the quandaries that we're up against, especially here in the deep south in the cool season, it seems, is not all supercells move to the right of the mean wind. Um, I, I think that the low and mid level wind shear and wind profile, the hodograph, has to be just right or within a, a set of range of conditions for that to occur, and buoyancy uh, may also contribute. A certain ratio or range um, of Cape distribution within within a certain portion of the atmosphere might allow for right moving cells, but I don't want to get too far off the beaten path here, the path that we're trying to, to forge. But um, number two on the caveat list there, storm relative felicity has a high incidence of false alarm um, and should be used cautiously in forecasting. So oftentimes what you'll see, uh, what this means is You'll have, um, take the southeast cool environment or cool season um, setup, for instance. Say that storm relative felicity is 600 near Nashville, Tennessee. Um, well, as a forecaster, you just wouldn't want to issue a high risk and start screaming tornado outbreak, right? Just because the SRH is pumping 650, you can't do that because um, your other range of conditions may not be there. You might have a saturated troposphere and you cannot account for release of, of potential instability. Um, you know, you might have your LCL height might be too high. Um, you see, so, you know, you may not have any, any buoyancy to account for that can, you know, help um, sustain and vigor, uh, vigorous updrafts. So there's lots of other ways that uh, storm mode can, can, can fail and even thunderstorm uh, genesis can fail uh, that would not allow, not allow for tornadoes, if I can get my words out there. So it's highly complex tornado genesis, and we just don't, you know, understand. Um, we do understand a lot, but there's a lot of aspects we still don't understand. And so, but it's been known for a long time that SRH is very valuable, but you have to have other players involved as well in order to be able to get the expected result, tornadoes. So do realize that. And as you forecast more and more, you'll get better and better with using storm relative felicity as a forecasting parameter during severe storms. Um, and we'll, we'll make another video down the road further about that, but uh, I don't want to drag on too long here, but part three can have significant spatiotemporal uh, variance like any meteorological parameter. So what that basically means is um, you can have very wide ranging uh, storm relative felicity values over a fairly short uh, space. Um, so it can change up very abruptly, you know, like across a boundary um, or even within a warm sector. You know, as you, as you really crank up the wind fields further toward the, uh, the surface cyclone and low-level jet or the interaction of the two-layer mass response closer to the upper jet, um, you, can, you can rapidly change your salivaric um, response and, and cause storm relative felicity to fluctuate widely spatio-temporally. So that's for another day, but I did want to go over how, how to calculate storm relative felicity. Again, this is the more formal, um, more academic approach. Uh, the one that would probably get you good grades on a test, and I think that's what, for most instructors, of course, unless they obviously tell you to do it differently. The layer centering technique that um, I came up with is also good. 
uh, let it be known I did not come up with this method that we just discussed here that's not my work um, that's from Davies Jones and um, some others that, that have contributed uh, pioneers of the field so but the layer centering technique I did come up with and you can find that in another video uh, if you'd like to, to learn more about it that way will probably take you less time than this but this one will probably get you closer to even uh, the value you'd like to have so okay guys I hope you've enjoyed this and I sure hope it helps uh, y'all have a great evening bye bye